Great, thanks for allowing the opportunity to present the exciting work we are pursuing at Solugen. My name is Tony Lee, Director of Enzymology. I've had the pleasure for the last three years to work with brilliant minds on the production of safe carbon neutral or carbon negative chemicals. Let's dive into our radical new chemical production platform and discuss how we are leveraging this technology to address some of the world's most pressing global environmental problems. Next. Solugen is interested in making the world cleaner and safer through better chemistry. By 2030, we aim to accomplish three major goals. First, we aim to sequester 10 million tons of carbon dioxide, the equivalent of taking 2 million cars off the road. The combination of renewable feedstocks, efficient processes, and sustainable product end uses renders our chemicals carbon neutral or negative. Second, we aim to replace 5 billion bottles worth of non-degradable plastic through becoming a major producer of bioplastic monomers. Solugen's technology allows us to generate unique monomers from renewable feedstocks, enabling the production of biodegradable materials and eliminating harmful additives. Finally, we aim to make 90% of all chemicals. Our innovative platform technology allows us to rapidly scale simple processes for quick and impactful results. Let's take a look at Solugen's roots next. Our company was founded by Gaurav Chakrabarty and Sean Hunt in 2016 after meeting at a university poker game. Gaurav, a physician scientist, was pursuing his PhD studying a hydrogen peroxide producing enzyme commonly found in certain cancers. Coincidentally, Sean was pursuing his PhD at MIT, researching ways to use metal catalysts to produce hydrogen peroxide. After pairing up to produce peroxide using Gaurav's enzyme and Sean's chemical engineering expertise, the duo realized that they could apply the system generally to produce almost any chemical via what they called a chemi-enzymatic process. Next. Before we discuss what we mean by a chemi-enzymatic process, let's consider the alternatives. Fermentation uses renewable feedstocks to generate complex molecules, but loses half of the feedstock to CO2 via cellular respiration. Modern petrochemical processing produces chemicals at high yields and high throughput, but relies on fossil fuels while generating toxic side products. Solugen's chemi-enzymatic platform harnesses the benefits of both incumbent technologies without the downsides. First, enzymes provide high selectivity, enabling the use of carbon-negative bio-based feedstocks. Durable metal catalysts then perform the heavy lifting required to produce low-cost chemicals at scale, taking intermediates produced by the enzymes and converting them to final products. Combining these two platforms with AI-driven process technology resort, results in short pathways to products, resulting in high product yields, elimination of waste streams, safe operations, and low costs of production. Next. The advantages of our chemi-enzymatic process ripple to larger benefits during scale-up. What you're looking at here is the embodiment of Solugen's new platform for producing chemicals, we, what we call the BioForge. By cascading enzymes with metal catalysts, the BioForge converts feedstock directly into target products with high yield, throughput, and specificity. As a result, the only downstream steps are single evaporator to remove water and a crystallizer to create a solid final product. At 10,000 tons per year scale, our downstream separation contribution costs are under $150 per ton. The BioForge is the world's first carbon negative manufacturing platform with no greenhouse gas emissions, no wastewater emissions, and 60% gross margins. Next. The BioForge platform has the potential to impact industrial CO2 emissions by utilizing carbon negative feedstocks versus fossil fuels reducing process-related emissions through increased efficiency, and in some cases, producing chemicals for end uses that can sequester carbon, such as concrete admixtures or wastewater treatment and disposal. In this way, Solugen's platform can directly and indirectly reduce CO2 emissions in approximately 60 or 30% of existing industrial sectors, accounting for 6% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Next. Let's look at an example. Here we're comparing the greenhouse gas emissions related to production and use of chelating products for wastewater treatment as calculated by the independent firm Lifecycle Associates. A majority of these chemicals are produced from fossil fuels and are associated with the highest greenhouse gas emissions. Bio-based alternatives still result in net positive CO2 emissions due to reliance on fermentation to produce feedstocks or product. Solugen's wastewater treatment 
products, however, are produced from feedstocks generated from non-fermentative processes and utilize enzymes rather than microbes as biocatalysts, resulting in net negative carbon emissions. Next. The ability to rapidly scale a technology is critical to impact. In less than five years, Solugen developed and scaled its chemienzymatic platform and built its first bioforge based on this first of a kind technology. We can deploy additional bioforges in approximately 18 months. This is much faster and cheaper than any fermentation or petrochemical manufacturing plant can be built. For example, 150,000 ton per year of future bioforge capacity will be online in the time it takes an incumbent to install a 5,000 ton per year fermentation or petrochemical plant. A few of the factors enabling this rapid scaling include heavy integrating uh, process or heavily integrating process engineering and catalyst R&D teams, taking advantage of modular fabrication and assembly, and incorporating AI process control such that a bioforge can be operated by a team as small as 12 people. Next. Solugen's products address a wide range of unmet needs in diverse industries while providing a plethora of environmental benefits. For example, our clean water products control corrosion without phosphates, reducing the occurrence of harmful algal blooms. Our agricultural products enable high absorption of nutrients, are non-toxic, and fully biodegradable. Next. Solugen is able to quickly develop new products by working directly with customers. Here's one example of our co-creation process. In March, 2020, a team was implemented to examine industrial water treatment. After pitching a data package demonstrating efficacy to existing and potential customers for feedback, a first purchase order was obtained in November, 2020, only eight months post ideation. This effort resulted in numerous offtake agreements for our first Bioforge in 2021. Next. And we are just getting started. With their first 10 KTA manufacturing plant operational in Houston, Texas, we now have five additional bioforges currently in the planning stages to address our 2030 goals. Thank you for listening and please look out for more updates from us as we continue to grow. Thank you so much. That is Dr. Tony Lee there telling us about Solugen and they're positioning themselves now as the first carbon negative molecule factory that can really scale to meet the world's needs. So she walked us through a couple of their innovations there with renewable feedstocks and high performance bioplastics. So a lot more to come and, and we appreciate her time. Um, we also have two other folks who have come in. In fact, they've flown in from the United States this time and we're switching gears here and now we're going to talk about completely changing and transforming the way metal is made. That's what this company is about, really about decarbonizing steel production. Uh, so you'll be meeting a gentleman named Tadio Carniero, who is the chairman and CEO of Boston Metal. But before he tells you uh, in person uh, what their solutions are, we'd love to show you a quick video to introduce this incredible innovation coming from Boston Metal. Global steel production has almost tripled in the past 50 years, with 2 billion tons produced in 2021. As the premier structural material in everything around us, demand for steel will only continue to grow. While steel is the foundation of our society, it's also one of the greatest threats to the future of the planet, contributing 10% of global carbon emissions. For thousands of years, humans have burned fossil fuels to produce molten steel. With the growing imperative to halt climate change, steel producers are under increasing pressure from investors and customers to decarbonize what is traditionally a very expensive and complex multi-step process. The steel industry needs a direct, scalable solution to reach net zero on the timeline society is demanding, while keeping costs down and creating value throughout the supply chain. For the hard-to-abate steel industry, Boston Metal is commercializing a disruptive technology that can reach the economies of scale required by the exploding demand for green steel. The company's patented MOE platform provides an unprecedented one-step end-to-end solution for zero CO2 emission steel production. Using renewable energy instead of fossil fuels, the platform can convert all iron ore grades into high-purity liquid metal providing new value across the steel supply chain. Boston Metal, scaling a revolutionary technology to decarbonize the most important engineering material in the world.
Good day, everyone. And uh, I want to start by thanking Tim Athic for uh, let, letting us come and present Boston Metal for this opportunity to show what we are doing. And, and also start by saying that with five, five minutes, you can't be too humble. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry for that. But that's, so I came here to, to show you that I, I have the pleasure to work in what uh, uh, it is the best time since they invented sliced bread. So we are, we are uh, decarbonizing steel manufacturing by using electricity. And this is very important because it's a very big piece of the puzzle. It's almost 10% of all the CO2 emitted in the globe today. So <clears throat> steel is arguably the most important engineering material and will continue to be. Two billion tons of steel manufactured every year. And the thing is, uh, it's, uh, since the Iron Age, which you remember, it's uh, 1200 BC, you manufacture steel by mixing iron ore with coal and emitting lots of CO2. So what we are doing is we are eliminating coal, eliminating the carbon from the equation by using electrons and, uh, and uh, using electrolytic cells to do that. So you continuously add iron ore to this cell that has a soup of other oxides. We are very simple oxides, like alumina, silica, uh, magnesia, calcia. And uh, the iron, by design, the iron oxide is the least stable oxide in the mixture. So as the electrons pass by, as you use electricity, you break the bonds of the iron oxide, get your iron for your steel, and emit oxygen. So uh, you can see the several different ways that you can manufacture steel there. Uh, your, your, your very first one is the incumbent, uh, where you have iron ore being prepared, mixed with coal, uh, which has to be transformed into coke, go into the blast furnace, you have a, a pig iron, you move to a BOF, and you blow more oxygen to uh, eliminate the excess of carbon. Uh, so that's what we want to eliminate, and uh, we are going to phase out, right? So 70% of the steel in the world is manufactured this way. Obviously, if you have scrap that can be remelted and recycled, that's the best way to do it. Only 30% of the steel is manufacturing today by remelting scrap. You don't have two billion tons of scrap to remelt every year. So you, you heard a lot about hydrogen green steel. Uh, it is possible. It will exist. Uh, it, it does, in a sense, in, in, in small scale, because it uh, uses a very established, well-established technology for 50 years, which is direct reduction. The problem there is you need premium iron ore for that technology to work. And then we have uh, the molten oxide electrolysis, which is the technology we are using. So very simple, one step. Iron ore added in the cell, electricity passes, and you get your, your molten steel. So <clears throat> uh, it is the only technology that can scale up to billions of tons. And, uh, and here you can see why. So the impurities in the iron ore are actually the components of the electrolyte for our process. So when you use an iron ore that is not as rich, there is no problem. What you are doing is you are adding more electrolyte in the cell. So that doesn't do any harm to the way we manufacture steel. Uh, with, with the hydrogen steel, you know, the easiest way, which is using the GR pellets, which are very rich iron ores, it's only 3% of all the seaborne traded iron ore today. Even if you invest a lot into big smelters to use a little bit of more impurities, you will, you will take care of another 20%. Uh, and you'll, you'll never go past a quarter of the iron ore available to manufacture the steel as we need it today. So <clears throat> where we are with the technology, we have the technology validated at the R&D level and 
until the end of the year, we should finalize stabilizing the development at the pilot level. Uh, you saw in, in the, what you saw in the movie was an actual tapping of our pilot cell in, in Woburn. And uh, from that point on, we will demonstrate the technology at the industrial level, which we intend to do 24, 25, in order to be commercial in 2026. So we were able to attract uh, a very uh, talented group of multidisciplinary uh, colleagues to solve the problem, and we have the help of a world-class group of investors backing us uh, after two important rounds of finance and very successful rounds of finance that we had so far. We are now uh, working uh, on, on the third round of finance to go all the way to the commercialization of the technology. So, in summary, we have the only technology to solve the problem that still represents in uh, emitting CO2. We can disrupt the industry in many ways. Uh, one, one, one that I would mention to you is think about the iron ore mines having electricity available. You bring the cells there and you ship a metallic rather than shipping iron ore. So you ship 40% less weight and you ship a higher value added product. And uh, you also have this technology as a platform technology. We will deploy a parallel business that will extract value from mining waste and slags that represent uh, a bad thing for corporations today. Uh, we are able to use our technology to take value from those mining waste, and we are deploying this right now. So we should be profitable even before 2026 when we intend to have the big prize represented by the steel uh, ready in the market. So thank you very much for your attention. And I want, I wish, I want to add by wishing luck to everyone uh, who is working together in this journey of moving us from the carbon age to the electrons age. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carnero, for walking us through. Boston Metal, really impressive. They're the only technology to scale up to billions of tons. We're very excited to see this come into fruition in a much, much bigger scale. Uh, so truly, they're decarbonizing steel manufacturing and meeting that exploding growth and that demand for green steel. So we are moving now from steel and we are focusing on cement. So joining us also from the United States, he has flown in to be here as a part of Ecosperity Week 2022, is Dr. Ryan Gilliam. He is the CEO of Forterra and he's going to tell us about this disruptive technology, this time in the world of cement. We can't wait. Thanks so much. Great, I'd like to just start by thanking Tomasic and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk on such an important topic around uh, decarbonization of heavy industries. I'm also really encouraged to be a part of an event like this where there's such strong alignment across everyone that's involved on the need to get to, to net zero. So over the next few minutes, what I want to talk about is with the work we're doing at Forterra to reduce the CO2 emissions, emissions associated with the production of cement. The challenge with cement really comes down to scale. Cement and concrete are the second most consumed thing on Earth behind water. So if you want to have a meaningful impact, you're going to have to address it on a large, on a large scale. Over the course of this decade, it's projected that cement production is going to get to 5 billion tons a year of production. And so if things don't change, whether it be from energy efficiency or fuels or alternative products, that means you're going to get to 4 billion tons of CO2 associated with cement by the end of the, by the, end of the decade. And so, again, to, to have a meaningful impact on this beyond kind of a niche application, our thesis is really you need to meet four criteria to have a technology that will be broadly used uh, globally. The first is to leverage the existing feedstocks that are already in place. The concept of trying to come up with a new technology or new product that can meet 5 billion tons of demand is going to come out of significant both environmental and economic hurdle if you don't use the, the, the feedstocks that are already there. The second 
is to leverage the trillion dollars worth of capital infrastructure already placed in cement. The concept of trying to compete in a commodity space where, you already have, where you're competing against technology that already has sunk capital will be very difficult. The third is to create a technology or to create a product that already fits within the existing regulations. Now, we are optimistic that regulations will change over time, but the challenge is cement and concrete are used in life-bearing applications, whether it be buildings or bridges, and so there's a need for that material to be both safe and reliable, so it's going to take time for those regulations to change. And the fourth is for the technology to compete economically without a premium for green and without a CO2 price. Now, a premium for green and a, and a price on CO2 are going to be very important to help for early adoption, it's the same way you've seen with solar or wind or, or electric vehicles. But again, if you want to have a meaningful impact on a 5 billion ton a year, year market, you're going to have to be able to compete on, on economics to be rolled out, rolled out broadly. So, Fortier, how are we doing that? So if you look at how traditional cement is made, you take limestone, one of the, the Earth's most abundant minerals, you quarry that, crush that, put it into a kiln at really high temperature, and the challenge is then 44% of that mineral by weight is released as, as CO2. Well, the opposite actually happens in nature. As opposed to taking that mineral and releasing CO2, in nature, if you look at how coral reefs are formed, they're actually taking the CO2 that's in the ocean and they're making a reactive form of that exact same mineral to create that cement that builds the coral reefs, or it's the same way how a lot of shells are formed in nature. And so what we figured out at Forterra was how do we take something that only happens in nature on the fraction of a second, but now do it in a way that we can industrially scale it up and create this reactive mineral that'll stay shel shelf stable, so you can put it into a cement bag or you can put it into your silo, and it's not going to react until you add water and want it to react afterwards. So effectively, what we're doing is we're going from mined limestone, which is the traditional feedstock in, in cements, 80% of the feedstock to the kiln in cement, and we're making a reactive form of that, that same limestone. From an overall process perspective, the reason why this works both on CO2 and, and economics really comes down to that 44% of that weight of CO2 that you typically lose. So if you look at the limestone going into the kiln after you heat that up, you lose CO2 in traditional cement production. Uh, that accounts for about 50% of the CO2 emissions in cement. The other 50% come from the heat or the energy going in to heat up that kiln. In our process, we're doing that same front end, it's leveraging those same feedstocks, lever leveraging that same infrastructure, but then we're recapturing that CO2 with that lime to now form our reactive form of, of mineral. And so because we gain back that 44% of that weight that was lost as CO2, it means we're much more efficiently using the feedstocks, the, we're much more efficiently using the energy in the kiln per ton of product produced, and that also what drives the economics, that extra 44% weight of CO2 that we, we absorb and create our product ends up making more product in the end, which drives the, the economic savings. So we've been putting our product out into real-world applications for almost a decade now. It is a slow process getting uh, adoption within the space. When I said about fitting with the, the existing regulations, it really is a phased approach that we're looking at. So I know these samples are very small to see out there. Um, it would have been a very heavy carry-on bag if I brought bigger cement samples. Uh, but what we're starting is 15% is replacement of cement. It fits within the regulations that already exist. We're synergistic with trends that are happening in the cement space to go to higher clinker reduction, 50% or higher. And this is using calcine clays. But the benefit of what we're doing is we can go all the way to 100% Forterra cement. And so this means that we can go all the way to replacing cement uh, altogether. And I think that there's use applications that will be interesting early on for, for doing that. So from a CO2 perspective, I've already talked about where we get the savings by capturing that CO2 back in and being more efficient on the energy use in the kiln. The other side of it is that as we go to electrification of industry, the benefit of what we're doing is it's lower temperatures in the kiln than traditional cement, so we can integrate with electric kilns and go all the way to a zero CO2 emission cement. While we've been innovative on the product side, we've also had to be innovative on the business side. And so we've talked with all the cement majors and looking for what are their pain points to be able to adopt a new technology like ours. And so it's been about creating a creative business model that allows them to produce more product, to reduce CO2, to get margin and benefit from that, but at the same time avoid having to take some of the capital risks typically associated with adopting a new technology like ours. 
So where we're at is we are now building our first smaller commercial plant in Northern California. It'll be up and running by the end of this year. We'll be putting products to the market to show that the product meets the performance criteria like we know it does, but also to make sure that we can prove out that it also meets the economic targets of being a lower cost cement to, to produce. We're also now in, in talks to line up the first two commercial plants in the US. And similar to what we're doing in the US, we are looking now more globally, both Europe and Asia, in terms of opportunities to, to partner and scale the technology. So just as a high-level summary on, in terms of what we're doing, what I would like to just end with is saying I am optimistic by what I'm seeing in the cement space. I think between uh, investors interested in new technologies in the space, the cement majors being willing to look at opportunities to get to net zero, um, policies that are being put in place specifically to address CO2 and cement, and just the number of, of interesting startup companies and academic uh, pursuits that are happening right now to reduce CO2. So it is a large, a large space, and I think it's going to take a number of great solutions to, to reduce CO2 to net zero. Uh, but again, I'm optimistic that we'll get there. Thank you.